Holler if you hear me, and welcome to this week's edition of Loop Targets, because we have a nice silver lining, a good contrasting comparison to make to the awfulness of everything associated with the Acolyte and that puke-inducing trailer done by the worthless Leslie Headland, while we've got season two of an actually worthwhile show of a worthwhile franchise that has been ongoing, and with its terrible final season being redemmed by this new show, House of the Dragon, and how the black and green trailers, as they're called now for season two, are out now and also are due to have this show premiere on Max right there for only $9.99 and also in the middle of June right up there up against the Acolyte. So you're going to have something else to watch on a streaming service that is, well, much more worthwhile than Disney. But then again, if Charlie Manson had his own streaming service, it would be more worthwhile of your time and your money than Disney+. Plus. And that's something that I think even the cannibals in Haiti would agree with. And why personally would me, a self-professed normie who has only a cursory knowledge of Game of Thrones, would be interested in this? Well, considering that I am somebody who's right now in the middle of making my very own little fantasy comic, which all 48 pages of have been fully drawn right here. Yes, I don't do anything digital. Digital is for suckers. This is all the actual concrete 48-page comic with now the lettering stage beginning and the first three pages having been fully lettered with more to do today. I am up and ready to see what is the other things out there in the world of fantasy in that type of adventure, although definitely what I'm making is definitely going to be a lot different from the world of GOT and the world of it being more interested in sociopolitical quagmires and the build up to major events of horrific violence and epic battles than of anything with just straight up having big action and one big one clear protagonist going up against a world where it's a story where it's less about the backstory and the world building and more about one coherent ABC kind of plot. It's the exact opposite of where fantasy fiction started with the work really even before Tolkien, there was Robert E. Howard and the stories he would write of King Cull or Sullivan Kane or Conan where those were done in pulp magazines with one strongly defined protagonist leading you through a tightly plotted action adventure story. While with Game of Thrones, it's very closer to the phone book size socio-political battles where it's more about this faction versus that faction and going through all these different points of view and all these different protagonists with all these different worlds and backstories and cities that they're living in. But even with where we see in Game of Thrones, that is only a specific point in that world's history and there's so much history going on that has gone on in the story before we get to the time of the show that there was another succession of books being made and written all that long before them. And that one, oh yes, the old House of the Dragon, that's just the beginning, uh, that was just the beginning of that prequel series where it's actually not Martin entirely writing by himself. Something that maybe, well, if he finally jumped on to do with his main two remaining Game of Thrones series, we might actually see that saga finished in The Gentleman's Lifetime if he would go on and hire a co-writer or a ghostwriter or some such. Like what happened to other beloved uh, science fiction or fantasy writers as they got older, and then they would have some co-writer working with them, like an Arthur C. Clarke being a major example who prolifically in his later years worked with co-writer Robert Silverberg to actually really get the nitty-gritty of these manuscripts finished. But that's all just pipe dreams. Yes, we have to focus more on the concrete reality of this uh, giant world where there's dragons flying around and we've got Doctor Who and albino hair. Although, mm, remember, it's still for Matt Smith with how dignified he looked in all the promotion for House of the Dragon. This new trailer or new trailers coming out definitely looks at him. You look at him and you see this is a guy who is grateful to have a role where he can really go and do something other than perpetually be under the shadow of Doctor Who. The fact that Matt Smith has found a big, major, dignified, successful role for himself after leaving the show by going on to another big ongoing science fiction or fantasy franchise, that is worth some kind of irony or chuckles, but at least he's being in something that people are actually going to see. You know, the exact opposite of his supporting roles in Terminator Genesis or Pride and Prejudice and Zombies or that indie film nobody saw where he played Robert Maplethorpe. And the rest of the cast, well, remember, with Game of Thrones, it's very much in the tradition of how epic fantasy or historical, ancient historical epics have always been portrayed. And most fantasy films that have been getting made in the Hollywood for the longest time are still made in the way that historical epics or biblical epics were made from the very early days of silent film to what we've been seeing now, where 
smother the cast in British actors because for whatever reason, it's been now safely assumed that in Hollywood, nobody will take an historical epic or a fantasy film seriously unless it's filled with a bunch of British accents. Even if you have American actors in the cast, which both things like the Lord of the Rings movies and Game of Thrones had American actors in it, but still they have to go and put on English accents. Although most of uh, the smoot of the show was produced out in the uh, Nordic uh, countries like Iceland, and also a lot of the mythology of certain countries are very much built on more Nordic kind of adventures and Nordic kind of myths. But that's, of course, you know, Hollywood's gonna Hollywood. While uh, Game of Thrones has definitely been, except for the last few seasons, when Dan and Dave proved that they are creatively powerless without actually having real George R.R. R. Martin written material to work with, still, yeah, Hollywood's gonna Hollywood. And House of the Dragon was a night great, nice, great, beautiful whiff of fresh air in the wake of how terrible, terrible, terrible the Rings of Power was and doing everything it can to ignore and defy and humiliate the lore and not just humiliate the lore of Tolkien and Lord of the Rings story in general, but also go and actively take all of the centuries of history before the main story of Lord of the Rings, like what the Silmarillion is to Lord of the Rings, that's what House of the Dragon is to Game of Thrones, we get all of the insufferable modern audience pandering horseshit that nobody actually wants to watch, even if technically you can watch the show for free if you have a Prime membership. And well, let's just say, uh, yeah, even with that 15 and change a month I pay for, I still am not watching Rings of Power. I'd rather just go and randomly watch uh, nine hours of me sketching random Lord of the Rings characters from memory with a fountain pen I would buy for myself from Amazon than ever watch a single second of clean-shaven Mr. T in a dress trying to pass herself off as some kind of a dwarf. At least with this story, with Game of Thrones, although, of course, there are some details, like I said, the longtime standard trope of any kind of epic fantasy story or historical adventure has to be nothing but English accents. Even if it's Welsh or Scottish or Irish actors involved, like uh, Rhys Siphons, who is Welsh, hence the hardest hell to pronounce name. One thing about the country of Wales I appreciate is the fact that it's one of the few other nationalities out there that has more difficult to pronounce and spell names than, you know, in my own family. So, well, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, but that's something we've always seen with British actors in these movies. But now we've got some of that casting choice as well. Remember, with modern Hollywood, you gotta make some concessions. Of course, modern Hollywood, get a modern Hollywood somewhere. I mean, we all saw how successful and well-liked that Sidney Sweeney's romantic comedy was, Anyone But You. But still, of course, because modern Hollywood, they gotta shoehorn in that it, the whole movie revolves around a lesbian indexed race uh, wedding destination because... They're gonna, it's gonna be in there somewhere. They're gonna force it in somewhere. The only way you're gonna see any kind of movie like that, any kind of movie get made that isn't forced with the DI horseshit, is going to be some independent thing. And if that becomes successful, then watch Hollywood re and then go out of the way to sabotage the production. But enough about uh, Sound of Freedom. Well, Thrones, we see everything that the show is known for from the very ponderous, very intense demands of of reaching absolute political power in the world, as we see with the rightful heir to the Targaryen throne, who is going to do everything she can in her power to try and get her seat, since she was the firstborn, and well, the firstborns apparently are the ones who go out of their way to be handed the throne, because, well, that's how royalty works, and instead, we got someone else, someone who happens to be also in the line, and that is something that you can go and see as, all right, well, with the first season of House of the Dragon, for the most part, it stuck to the lore of what those prequel books were, and besides certain, of course, out-of-place, uh, you know, woke casting with intersectional checkboxes being filled out, that was a minor thing as opposed to the major things. And here, well, now we've got the major thing of I am going to be the king. I will take the throne wherever. Coming from a woman, knowing how modern Hollywood writers can help themselves, that's the major detail of these trailers. It looks like, I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. Because remember, HBO also did a really good job with the first season of that Westworld show, only for its subsequent seasons to devolve into insufferable femscold vengeance baiting. Because, well... What else would you expect from a show that has the brain-dead Tessa Thompson in the cast? The woman who uses her skin color to masquerade how she's no different from any other casting couch hoe and is arrogant enough and stupid enough to even be caught in public with her hand in a director's crotch. You know, those paparazzi photos that uh, the uh, MCU people want you to forget about. 
just like how they pretty much want you to forget about her acting in general, but we already forget about her acting on our own. Well, Game of Thrones, on the other hand, in spite of the lavish production and elaborate special effects, it really is an example of TV being the writer's medium. And Game of Thrones, and now with House of the Dragon taking up the mantle, we are all, normies and diehard fans alike, got our fingers crossed that this is something that actually lives to entertain. I mean, there are some bright spots in mainstream Hollywood these days that do entertain. So now let's go and pull for the House of the Dragon to be the house of actual successful modern entertainment. And that's not my opinion. I know I'm right. So I want to thank you all for watching. Subscribe so my channel will reach 10,000 subscribers this year. Don't forget to become a member today. Membership started at $2.99. And shop at my art store with the second link below, where besides my artwork that's there for sale, you can also commission me and you can also donate. Donations in my store go directly to me instead of YouTube. And if you want to buy or commission my art from outside of America, just add up the prices of what you want in U.S. dollars with another 25 U.S. for the international shipping fee and pay as a donation. So until then, felines, slam it, lick it, suck it, and see you, Space Cowboy.